Um, there's a lot to talk about this film. Uh, it's, it's, it's so rich, uh, it's so beautifully put together, and it's also sort of heartbreaking, uh, considering the topic you're, you're uh, discussing here. Um, it does mention at the end that you worked on this for six years, um, but can you talk maybe at the beginning, like, uh, how did you discover um, this topic and all the archival that you used, uh, it's just the beginning? Um, yeah, I was reading a book by uh, the historian Rick Perlstein, and um, he covers mostly sort of the historical movements of the right um, through the 60s through the 80s, and he uh, had sort of put together this kind of laundry list of, of um, law and order, kind of extreme law and order reactions that were happening in the summer of 67, and Riotsville was just sort of in that list, and I had never heard of it, um, and I looked it up um, and found really nothing, um, except a few contemporaneous articles that were kind of poking fun at it. You know, the New York Times, like, hippies versus the military. And um, and it just seemed uh, a little too crazy to let go. Um, and so I found some footage or a record on the in the catalog of the National Archives that sounded like it might be the right thing, um, but it had never been transferred, so I just kind of ordered that blind, and when I saw the footage, I, it was just disturbing and astounding, and it said, I think, a lot about the country in a way that felt both sort of literally tied to the historical moment and its place in the development of the militarization of the police, and also on a broader sort of metaphorical scale um, about you know what we enact and rehearse and, and put money into and, and care about, and having a sort of visual record of what um, the government and the military sort of think of protest movements um, felt like a very rare thing to, to find. Uh, how much uh, did, did you get? How much material did you, did you get at first? Just of Riotsville? Mm -hmm. um, I think it was 15 hours. Um, yeah, I, it's hard to answer the question of how much footage was, it, was sort of pulled for the film because um, I basically just researched all the way to the very last second when I had to stop. So we were just, you know, as the film developed in the edit and with Toby and with Nels and, and you know, over the years, new things would come up. And so I would, so, I, uh, yeah, many hundreds of hours, I guess, okay, total. Yeah. But, yeah. 15 seems very reasonable, but, uh, yeah. I'm sure 15 silent <laughs> hours, yeah. And you're just staying on 67 and uh, 68. It bleeds a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's um, the the chronology of the film are those years. There's a bit at the end that's the the program, the Riotsville program, continued into the early '70s, and we use some of that footage towards the very end. Um, but yeah, the it's pretty limited to '67 through so, I guess '69 is the moon launch. So yeah. yeah. At what time did you bring Toby into the the, the project? Um, um, when, so it was, um, I guess, five years of sort of research and interviews and, you know, again, there was very little information about um, what Riotsville was, so for the first few years I worked with a, um, a researcher and we just looked at the, the names on the slates, the clappers, and cold called people whose names matched and just to try to piece together what Riotsville was um, and then got some more information in the Na National Archives, but... Um, so after five years, I, we started properly with Nels um, Bangerter, the editor, and then Toby came on it as the writer at that same point. So, um, you know, the writing wasn't, it, it all kind of was formed together. The writing informed the edit, and the edit informed the writing, and we were working um, pretty much doing those things at the same time. I wasn't sure if you edit it first and then you would write the text after, but it makes much more sense to do it together. Uh, so can you talk about uh, when you came into the project, when you were watching the, the, the footage and how you decided to write the text that came with it? Um, well, it's all a blur, but I'd say the first cut of the film that I saw was didn't bear that close resemblance to what you just watched, but it was close enough in that there were definitely long sections of Riotsville footage, and then there were kind of snippets of television interviews, and then there were these huge kind of blank sections in which I was informed 
I was supposed to supply words. Um, and so basically, I mean, the way that it worked is that every week I basically had a homework assignment and then I'd be given a theme and then we'd kind of talk about what I'd managed to produce. And then overall, the content of that week's uh, production would be broken up or redistributed throughout the film or changed. And then basically, uh, at, at a certain point, the process became automatic and a kind of acquired lift. And so conversations about the text ended up becoming conversations about editing. And all of the conversations I was having with Sierra, I was also having with Nels, the editor. So um, at a certain point, the specific voiceover has to have a kind of organic connection to the parts around it. And that's necessarily because all three of us were contributing our specific skills to that. So on a mechanical level, that's how it worked. I don't know how curious people really are about that, but that's always how I answer this question. It was, it was, it was uh, I'm one of the more beautiful collaborations I think I've been part of because it was that organic, like Toby was sending me an article and I'd read and send my like bad marginalia back and it just, it was this really sort of rich conversation. Yeah, it began with a basically a reading list. Like I sent Sierra a bunch of things that I thought um, we all ought to have read and she did the same to me. And so it actually began with a kind of riot syllabus that basically went through the Kerner Commission report, secondary literature about the Kerner Commission report, all sorts of things about the discourse of riots in the 1960s. Um, so it began as a kind of reading group, even though I don't think we've ever discussed it that way because that's shameful. Um, but no, what you just saw is basically the kind of calcified result of a reading group. Why is a reading group shameful? <laughs> no, because I'd, I'd like to think that we were um, producing an aesthetic object, oh, but okay. yeah. <laughs> it is, it is. Uh, were you working in sort of chapters then, you know, like week by week, or? Mm. Um, just like more fluid, sort maybe. Of, yeah. yeah, but then there was just like a big horrible document with just a lot of text, and Nels and I would move things around, and Toby would be like, what have you done to our, you know? Um, this was I, also I was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I was sensitive we were very, nice. very nice. This is all during the pandemic also, the um, entire edit and writing process. So this was all on Zoom. So basically we just, I just turned Zoom on in the morning and let it run all day, all week. Okay. One thing is also striking about the film. I mean, the content is, in, is incredible, uh, but it also you make it into a, a really a work of art. And I think it's also the way you blend the images together, but also the way you use the sound uh, around. Uh, can you talk about uh, how you created this sound and the soundscape all around the film? Yeah, I mean, it. Um, something about the footage that was really tricky and part of the reason it took so long is that, you know, a lot of it's very absurd um, and there's a, such a darkness to the absurdity and, um, you know, trying to figure out how to work with that because uh, it is not actually funny. I mean, and, and that absurdity to me felt like um, a reflection of how, you know, any, and whoever's in that scene, you know, the, the guy selling the tank, the, the, the reporter in that scene, the, the, the people performing in Riotsville, um, the, the absurdity that they approach it with felt like a reflection of, um, the lack of care and you know it's a really cynical kind of gross um reflection of of their priorities um but trying to find ways to make clear that we recognize that in the film um was hard and you know aside from editing and text um the sound you know we had a lot of conversations with jace clayton who's a brilliant composer about you know riotsville should feel uncanny and a little bit alien, but not so alien that we forget this is the real world, because it is. So, you know, trying to sort of bridge those spaces. Um, and I think sound does a lot to um, to get us there. And also, you know, there's, we talk a lot about like the silence in the archive. Um, and that is kind of like a, a broader conversation about what's missing and, you know, whose voices have been excluded, but also it in this film, we were able to sort of literalize that. And so there are, there's footage in the film that is silent. And the fact that these community meetings where people are really expressing their needs to camera were totally recorded without sound. We hired a lip reader to try to pull what we could out of that, which is very little. Um, and I felt, um, you know, there's 
basically like 24 hour coverage of nothing happening inside the convention center and then like real life and real needs and real pain happening on the streets that has been barely recorded and you know sound has not lasted so so trying to really um emphasize those silences um and it felt a little risky you know how long can we i mean yeah how long can we leave silence up but it felt very important to do that so do you consider uh, this documentary as an essay, like a political statement as well as an experimental film, or do you just like a little bit of everything? Do you think it can make a difference when people see it? I don't, I, um, I think this, I don't, yeah, I think part of what I at least was wrestling with in making this is what the project of documentary can do, and that's why a lot of the, the voiceover is sort of asking that question, like, what are we looking at? What do we do with these images in 2022? Like, uh, what do we make of this history, and what role does it play? And uh, you know, and that those are a lot of my questions. Um, and I, I feel like um, it's important to have it on the record, and and also that. Um, everything in this film, for the most part, was broadcast on television, on mainstream channels, and we made a very deliberate effort to strip out anything that wouldn't have been so publicly available. Um, so this is, you know, big network, mm -hmm. national television broadcast and military footage. And so the idea that um, I, I kind of bristle at the idea of like a hidden history, because it isn't. This was all... This was a public history. This was on television. The Kerner Report was a bestseller. And the idea that we've forgotten it, I think, is actually more telling and infuriating than the idea that, you know, it was all covered up. And so, um, I mean, that's just one portion of the politics of the film, but that's a, a big one for me. Um, but, Toby, I think you can... Yeah, I mean, I'll remain agnostic on the question of whether or not it will make a difference. Obviously, in an ideal circumstance, this film would change the world irreversibly. Um, but I also am actually genuinely glad that this film is coming out now just because we're on the cusp of completely eclipsing the memory of the biggest uprising the United States has ever seen. Like I feel like this particular moment when this festival happens to be taking place is part of a larger chunk of time in which basically the largest spontaneous rebellion that any of us have ever seen that has ever taken place in living memory and basically has ever taken place since the Civil War was an enormous media event. It also impacted every aspect of daily life material life, urban life. It was a kind of crisis moment for the government, and it also forced all sorts of poorly answered, but I think very urgent questions on basically everyone. And some people have gone the Robin D'Angelo direction and decided this is going to be a moral drama. Other people have decided to rethink left strategy. Other people have defiantly decided not to rethink left strategy. But the important thing is that that happened almost two years ago, and it has had basically zero lasting or positive effect on any aspect of public life. And yet, it was enormous. And yet, everyone actually is aware that it happened. There actually isn't a single person who doesn't know that that happened. I'm not sure you can say that about any other political event except for maybe the election of Donald Trump. Like, I, I really do think this is the, the absolute scale of what happened in 2020 is astonishing and should inspire all of us. And yet, I think this film is in a way a testament not only to the fact that uh, time passes, but also that the project of forgetting and the project of kind of the concealment of events that every single one of us actually, almost to a one, has some subjective memory of, um, that that's actually part of how the machine operates. Um, that I think just as important, oh please, no, 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 I, I can't deal with that. Um, but, uh, but it's actually just as important to show not the fact that the state was bashing people's heads in, but that actually, before they did that, they had a model in which the exact mechanism of how exactly to bash people's heads in took place. That everything, uh, not to say that the state has complete control over every aspect of public life, but also that um, the events preceding and succeeding a riot are all being planned for that the Gulf kind of sponsorship of the conservative TV station, how black people are being represented in popular media, the views that are being aired on public television shows, every aspect of it is part of a kind of stagecraft that both does and does not succeed. So um, 
I guess it's good that we've all been reminded of that by the film. <laughs> um, and I actually, that, but that is a, a genuine intervention that I think um, other documentaries don't always make, that it's not just about uh, the kind of lurid moment of spectacle, it's also about the elaborate stagecraft that makes the image that we do and do not remember. Well, also putting like a f almost a full year and an enormous amount of state resources into investigating the causes of a riot, coming up with conclusions that answer that question very matter-of-factly and have a plan for basically redistribution, and then building a model town instead to train for riots. I mean, that um, I think is as disheartening as... yeah. And, and telling and, and blatant, you know, it's, a, totally. it's kind of infuriating. And just one last thing, because we talked about this a lot um, when we were making the film is, I mean, the film and actually watching it this last time really brought home to me the kind of diagrammatic way in which it dissects hopefully as many aspects of the state apparatus as possible. Like this is supposed to be in some ways a state's eye view of unrest. Like what if we were to have... Uh, kind of recollection of the late 1960s with no hero, not even a mass hero. The protagonist is in a way the state. It's just like the state has a problem. The state needs to solve that problem. The state encounters conflicts and the state ends up arriving at a kind of denouement, which is the complete uh, usurpation and destruction of an autonomous insurgent movement. So just like the state is actually the hero of this, but it's also supposed to be kind of anatomy of all the things that a state does. A state can, if it wants to, redistribute resources. It can be a redistributive mechanism. It can also uh, seek to control, or it almost always does seek to control, the kind of coursing of violence through a society. It acquires a monopoly on violence, but it's also a kind of model and provides lessons. I mean, Gramsci called it the ethical state. And I think that when you see women shooting at targets, hoping that they've hit the center, that is a kind of ethics. That's an ethical moment. That's a, a pedagogical moment, and it shows that the lesson is actually being very well learned. So another a political effect I hope um, the film has is just really uh, helping the viewer walk around inside the state for a second to see the many different rooms um, that the state contains. And some of them are actually redistributing tax dollars and lifting up the poor in whatever way is possible within the confines of a capitalist economy. And the other thing is basically violence, coercion, um, and certain more or less repressive forms of persuasion. So I think that was an important formal feature that we talked about a lot um, that I wanted to make sure I got into this Q&A. Are we allowed to clap now? No. Okay. We, we'll have clapping later. It, it's fine. Um, so you haven't done a lot of... Q You've done a lot of Q&As together. Yeah. Okay. We have, yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, this is our... Yeah. This is how it goes. <laughs> Uh, what's the audience response when you when you have discussion and you show the film in general? We've only been able to show it in person um, in Denmark. So oh, Sundance was virtual. Over, Sundance was virtual. Oh, um, it did play at the True Falls Film Festival. I wasn't there, but the I mean, the reactions that I've gleaned in the U.S. and I'm really eager to feel and hear more of them are, I mean, a sort of depressing range of like it's really helpful to see all this compiled because that's this is how this feel like people say like this is what we suspected was happening and it's really helpful to feel like we're not crazy because this country can make you feel like you're crazy um and um yeah that uh there's it seems like the reaction is that there it's a helpful illustration of the trajectory of militarization um I mean, yeah, it's, um, it was kind of my goal to find footage that was pretty unfamiliar from the 60s, even though, as I said, it was all broadcast. And so I think that um, it's been gratifying to hear that people are reacting to that, that it all feels pretty new and sort of like a House of Mirrors version of the, of the late 60s. It's, it's, it's depressing that most people are not aware of it. It's depressing that it was public. And it's depressing that nothing is changing. However, the movie is really beautiful. Um, and it also makes you think about what possible future can come out of that. Um, and I don't want to be too depressed because I always hope that it's going to get better. 
Um, well, maybe. Uh, well, the film technically ends on an optimistic note because uh, it attests to the ineradicability of riots themselves. Like the film ends with um, a recollection of a particular riot and then somebody's utopian imagination. I mean. I don't think Riotsville wins in the end, um, that we're still slung between these two possibilities. So um, yeah, stay tuned. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, it would be great to take some audience questions since you said you haven't been able to talk to the audience yeah. that much. So, And we have microphones. The lights are a little bright, but uh, is there any questions? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for this film. It was just remarkable. Could I ask each of you to give us, for those who don't know you, to give us a little bit of your background and how you, I, I mean your background in terms of filmmaking and writing that brought you to this. Um, I am a sort of archival researcher by trade. Um, so I've been working for other filmmakers um, for, I don't know, I'll say a decade, because that'll make me feel younger. Um, but uh, And then I've made a series of films that all in different ways focus on the right wing. Um, I made a film about the Tea Party with Jamila Wignott and um, a film called The Reagan Show um, that was all archival about the Reagan administration and then two shorts about the largest Confederate monument in the U.S. and one about the a kind of internal coup at the NRA. So, um, I am, I guess, particularly interested in these the ways the right wing show. There's sort of like an illustration of how they operate, often through these like sort of gross art projects, I suppose. Um, I'm a writer. I've never worked in a film before, and I usually write criticism. I've written a lot about film, though. Oh, Toby also wrote, I'm sorry, I plug this every time, but it's very important. He wrote an incredible essay called Magic Actions about the rebellions of 2020 that was published in M plus one and is available online and is like, he was working on it sort of in um, conjunction with... I just finished the first draft right before I started um, doing the script for this film. I personally found like being able to watch his process and writing that a little bit because we got to see some early drafts really inform this film and I it's just a really brilliant piece so I that's your background I'd like to highlight. <laughs> you can become his publicist if he's too shy. Uh, there was other question. Yes. Yeah. Congratulations, it was a really, uh, I love seeing the analog film. Um, just a, two questions actually. Um, when R the Senator Robert Byrd was talking and he said, uh, mentioned Martin Luther King, uh, and you know, accidentally being, you know, perhaps uh, killed in, during the a riot, and then you placed a title card um, saying that, you know, sometime later he, he did, you know, get murdered. Um, but it was within his own uh, sort of community. So w was there any, like, uh, did has anybody wondered the placement of the two title card, or, I mean, that it might be confusing? Um, that's one. And then the other thing is I, I found Toby, I mean, if he's a writer, why not give him the voice instead of the female voice? I could take both. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, that hasn't come up with the Robert Byrd um, piece. I don't think, I think because most of the film is sort of playing, kind of pushing archival against this sort of textual sort of context. Um, I, you know, think or hope that we're sometimes stepping in and out of various timescapes there. Um, that the bird there was intended to show that, you know, not imply that Robert Byrd had some sort of literal role in Martin Luther King's death, but that people on the floor of the Senate inside the House of the Government are basically calling for an activist that we have since decided is just, you know, um, 
Mickey Mouse or something, you know, is like a, a harmless figure. The fact that there was that kind of like murderous and violent intent, like within the halls of government from someone who identifies as a Democrat, even though we know Robert Byrd, you know, that's a, a loose interpretation of his affiliation, that that was the intention of that, that, you know, the the sort of vitriol and, and violence that um, was in discourse, you know, within the government itself at the highest levels. Um, I forgot the other question. Oh, Toby's voice. Yeah, I mean, the the we did a lot of, tried a lot of different things with voiceover. Um, we did have a version where Toby read some of it, and we had other people. We had different people reading different parts. We had eight voices, we had three voices. Um, we, uh, I don't think the film, I mean, I'm always, we've gotten the question about like, why isn't that my voice? Why aren't I speaking? Um, and I just, I guess it's a little confusing to me where uh, that people expect narration to always be a personal reflection, that it should be like the voice of Sierra. And when we, t when we were talking about it, we were like, this is the voice of the conscience of the country. What does that conscience sound like? It sounds angry and it sounds weary and it should be a woman. And, uh, <laughs> No, I mean that it was a lot of that like that was established from the beginning that it was not going to be a man or it was not going yeah, to be not, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and like okay, what does I authority sound like? You know, authority usually sounds like a man. You know, we were just like what do all these kinds of voices mean? Um, you know, and a filmmaker that we pulled a lot from was Chris Marker and and you know, he's often he's playing with several different voices who are in conversation and there's fake letters and you know, there's he's making up personas and I, you know, I think that's much more a starting point than like a kind of confessional cinema. So, um, yeah, I, I, I've struggled with that question because I, it, it sort of is a different set of expectations that I, um, that I don't, yeah, align with. We have time for one final question. I have the microphone in okay. the middle. Is that okay? Uh, mar a marvelous film. I wanted, Toby, I, I'm sorry to use your first name. I don't know your last name, so I, I was not presumptuous. I prefer but, my first name. Okay. Um, in your analysis about the writing of the film, you talk about the role of the state. I don't disagree with you. And the role of the state in this moment of riots, so we had the one at the White House also being, like a report being written, but the, the ones in 2020, you, you talked about the complete and total role of the state to muffle our memory, but I think one of the things that many of us are feeling inside of COVID and inside of the internet, it is not just the state that is muffling memory, but internal mechanisms, psychological mechanisms, survival mechanisms, and then corporate mechanisms in some extraordinary brew that has made something that all of us know to be true. <sighs> Two years later, not however many years later you guys tell the story of, so could you talk about, yes, the state, and more so how forgetting works in our immediate memory, in our moment? Anything about that I would love to hear you say. I'll just, yeah, I have a quick, I mean, no, I, I think when we talk about the state, I mean, there's the sort of a, the literal, literal description, but also as Toby said, it was very important for us to show how that trickles down in a way. And so the women doing, practicing their shooting is a really crucial part of the film to me because it's not, it's the way this in, infects and uh, sort of a fear-based rhetoric ends up in individuals and in communities and societies and makes conversations like abolition of the police impossible or, or difficult. And so the way that this, I think sometimes you, you'll be more precise about this, but when we talk of, or I talk about the state, it, it feels like a, it's a larger um, grouping of forces that are sort of working together. Yeah, um, what Sierra said basically, I mean, when we talk about the state, we're talking about the repressive apparatuses and the ideological state apparatuses. I really hope that nobody in the audience knows what I'm referring to, but I know that at least five people do. But even when we're not talking about literally what Louis Althusser wrote, um, I mean, in general, if we think about the state as, I mean, to 
kind of awkwardly quote myself. It's just like the state, the establishment, or whatever you want to call the, the what, um, people who keep the, things yeah, locked the, in place. Yeah, that exactly. But it's just like there needs to be some in order for life and let's say a capitalist society to reproduce itself on a very basic level. There needs to be something to iron out all of the kind of most extreme wrinkles. Um, but even when there isn't a riot currently going on, there are all sorts of softer, more appealing, less openly coercive uh, means of suggestion. And some of those means of suggestion you've already mentioned, like corporate, the internet, I mean, internal mechanisms. But obviously, there is an enormous desire on the part of most people to live comfortably. I mean, it actually goes back to the lyrics of Burn, Baby, Burn. Everybody wants to live like everybody else. Sometimes that's a kind of liberatory demand. Um, but oftentimes, it's just a conformist demand. And at the end of the day, no, we don't have the collective stamina or the organizational willpower to extend the rupture of 2020 infinitely into the future. Why is that? Because we have to go to our jobs. We have to get food that we need to pay for with money. Where does the money come from? It comes from this enormous web of interactions, relationships, and illusions, um, which actually have the result of producing value. I mean, uh, so I, I completely take your point. I do think that there are certain specific moments and mechanisms that we will look back upon as being important in the machinery of forgetting. One of those is the Democratic National Convention of 2020, um, in which uh, the uprising was recast as um, like largely nonviolent, which is technically true. Most of the demonstrations were not violent. I would actually argue that it was the violent ones that were determinative and actually made sure that it was as long and as enormous as it was, but I guess we will never know what the world would have looked like had they responded politely in Minneapolis. Um, but another thing that I think is important is that they had George Floyd's brothers get up and say, we want to get into good trouble the way that they did in the civil rights movement. I think that, again, I don't think that especially in a time after network television's total predominance in the internet when there is, as we all know, a much wider array and a great dispersal of images. But I do think that there are certain key symbolic moments that what passes for left of center in this country basically disavowed the rebellion um, and had to sanitize it in order for their own political position to make any sense. I think that was a huge moment. And it was the culmination of a lot of greater and lesser mechanisms um, and different forms of messaging that contributed to the feeling that, wow, it's so good that we have another civil rights movement. Hopefully this one, like the previous civil rights movement, will be completely clean. Hopefully this one will be identical to my favorite black and white photograph of Martin Luther King, which is of course what enacted change in the society basically overnight. I mean, the forgetting of the processual aspect of social change, which involves necessarily forms of conflict and rupture, I think that that, again, is, uh, it's being sold to us as a kind of psychological option in all sorts of ways, in both kind of direct and indirect ways. But there are certain big moments, I think there are certain big symbolic moments in which um, the door is being pushed rather forcefully closed on the actual events of the past. Well, I think we, I think we can clap now. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. We have another screening after. But thank you so much for being here. Thank you and so much for having us. I appreciate it.